Hi, Jim. Hi, how are you? Good. Um, so our next speaker is Jim Bianco. He is the uh, CEO and founder of Bianco Research. Bianco Research is a uh, research firm in the financial sector. They provide um, you know, insights and analytics for uh, the financial markets. Uh, they've been around for you know, several decades, have decades and decades of experience. And Jim uh, is a, uh, a macro thinker and he looks at um, high level financial uh, trends in fi global financial markets. Uh, I first heard him on the really excellent Macro Voices podcast that I recommend everybody listen to uh, because the, the wealth of information from this podcast is just absolutely uh, astonishing. So it really helps you get a really deep understanding of what's going on in financial markets right now. And uh, Jim's uh, interview was uh, you know, just as, as, as interesting as any other episode and, and that they produce. So um, thanks for joining us. And today you're going to talk about the Fed. And actually, you know, I wasn't able to pay much attention to this because yesterday we were on here all day long. Um, but uh, there was that, 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 uh, uh, that Fed announcement yesterday. So hopefully we'll get to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, thanks for having me. Make me feel old. I mentioned decades and decades of experience as well, too. So go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> let me talk about the Fed and uh, what happened. Let me let me start inside out <clears throat> a little bit with the Fed. Uh, yesterday they had their meeting. Uh, they didn't move interest rates. They didn't do anything of significance. But the only thing that kind of came out of the uh, out of it was uh, a couple of things. One, Chairman Powell said that all the programs, and I'm paraphrasing here or summarizing, all the programs that they have, don't worry about the size of the program. If need be, they will increase the size of the program and make it a much larger if they have to. So assume everything they do is unlimited. Number two. Uh, that he said is that they haven't started some of the programs that they've done yet. Like they haven't bought corporate bonds, they haven't bought ETFs, they haven't bought municipal securities. But the announcement effect has definitely helped the market quite a bit. Uh, it has really pushed the market uh, up. And he did say though that they will do those programs eventually. Now, uh, corporate bonds might come fairly soon uh, as well. Number three, um, is, as far as where the Fed is, is, is standing was, and the last major thought was, they are not in favor of negative interest rates right now. So don't look for the Fed to intentionally create negative interest rates. Now the market might create them because remember all a negative interest rate is, is a really, really high bond price. I like that technical term there, a really high bond price. Um, if you trade well above the uh, uh, the maturity price of the bond in excess of all the coupons, you get a negative interest rate. Now the bond market could do it, but the Fed won't engineer um, a negative interest rate. Uh, so here's the question, is the Fed making it better? Is uh, And the answer that I think to that is, it depends on what you think the Fed should be doing. There are no atheists in a foxhole. There are no capitalists in a crisis. Um, <clears throat> we could have this crisis and on one level, and I'm sympathetic to all these views and I'll give you mine too along the way. At one level, I can go a full Ron Paul on you. Government should be involved in anything. Failure is part of capitalism. You gotta just let everything shake its way out. And yet with a pandemic like we've had now with 30 million people filing for unemployment insurance in the last six weeks, which is an astonishing number to try and get your head around, uh, the economy could very well collapse. Now, on the other side of the equation, if you want to do like Donald Trump says, well, we'll get past this and, and then we'll, we'll go right back to where we were and we'll boom like we've never boomed before, that is suggesting that there will be a st complete status quo and there will be no change to anything except we're just going to bide our time and wait out this uh, uh, pandemic. That's a mistake too because it's apparent things are gonna to have to change. It is apparent we're going to need to see the economy bend and fold. There's gonna be changes to the supply lines. There's gonna be changes to the way that we work. This format that we're in now, working at home, might be very well a permanent feature from, from here forward. 
maybe not every day, but some of the days as well too. We need to basically have a, a, a very serious question as to why is it that every downturn we have to bail out the auto companies? Why is it that every downturn we have to bail out the airline companies? Why, it, why don't we allow new thinking, new ideas, different ways of doing things in some of these industries? By constantly bailing them out, we preserve the status quo and the status quo is what gets us into trouble as well too. So if the Fed's attitude which I don't think it is, was big changes coming fast. A lot of people are going to just get washed out to sea. Let's try and help manage the process of change. Okay, that's one thing, um, you know, but allowing it to happen. Or if their attitude, which I really think is more likely the case, let's not change anything. Let's just print money, borrow money, and let's keep going until we get past this pandemic and then we'll just go right back to where we were before and nothing needs to be changed. That's a mistake. That doesn't allow the organism of an economy to you know, um, get rid of losers and encourage winners. Look, the whole purpose of capitalism is to take money from bad ideas and give it to good ideas. And right now we don't seem to be doing any of that. We're giving money to hell ideas um, is what we're doing now. A little while ago, Boeing raised $25 billion. Um, could Boeing have raised $25 billion if there wasn't a Fed backstop behind it? Uh, I have my doubts, but nevertheless, uh, there is a Fed backstop and they did allow a company that reported negative airplane sales next year. Yes, they had more cancellations than they sold planes last year um, to raise $25 billion to stick around for, I assume, more negative airplane sales um, as well too. <clears throat> so we're not allowing that kind of... Uh, change to, to, come, to come down the pike as well. Um, what are the concerns that I have with what the Fed has been doing? The biggest one I have is with the bond market itself. And they, these numbers are really hard to get your head around. So I'm saying this, so when you hear me, yeah, you're hearing me right. Since, since March 13th, six weeks, six weeks, the Fed has bought over one and a half trillion dollars worth of securities, one and a half trillion in six weeks, approaching two trillion dollars. That would have been an eye popping year, and they did it in six weeks. Yet during that six week period, the 10 year treasury went from 62 basis points, five eighths of 1%, to um, uh, or, uh, 72 basis points, excuse me, five eighths of to 60 basis points, down 12 basis points. That's nothing. Why is it that with world record buying, bond market can't move? The answer is, I think, is what you're seeing is that everybody else is liquidating their portfolios to the Fed. Oh, so they're all going to risk. And that's why the stock market's going up. And that's why Boeing is getting their deals done to some extent. But a good part of that money, over $1 trillion of that liquidation, has found its way into, the, into money market funds. So by going into money market funds, a number of these uh, people are expressing more fear than they are expressing a willingness to take risk um, as well, too. So I think it's really the question you have to ask yourself is, is this economy what, what state of change are we in the economy? If you want to view this like a hurricane, it comes in, it floods a lot of basements, we have to do a lot of cleanup, and then we go back to the way we were, that's one way to look at it. Now, if you want to look at this as, as, as Peter Schiff likes to say, that COVID was the pin, but the bubble was there waiting for a pin, and quit analyzing the pin and more analyze the bubble, meaning that we're going to have to have larger changes underway uh, with this as well. I'm more in the, that camp that we're going to see um, bigger changes uh, as well from, uh, from that camp. So why is it then that everybody is liquidating their portfolios to the Fed? Ultimately, I think that there is a fear of a malinvestment and there's a fear and that malinvestment is, is the Fed by holding interest rates too low, stimulating too much, that while in the next year, we will probably see more deflation than inflation in the next year as the economy reels from the shutdown 
and however long it takes to restart. After you get past that, I think the market is looking at large deficits for many, many years and or inflation. And that's why the bond market has been struggling, even though it has had record buying. Uh, I, and so I've been a bond bull forever. And I think now that the 39-year bull market in bonds ended March 9th, maybe we retest it um, as we go from here. What next for the Fed? <clears throat> Two things. The stock market sold off 34%, peaked the trough in six weeks. A lot of people are now saying <clears throat> that that was it, that that was the bottom March 23rd. Let me restate that. There will be no bear market rally that we had a one, we had a straight line sell off. That was it. And the bull market started on, um, and the bull market started on uh, uh, March 23rd. Um, if that's indeed the case, this will be the first time that I can find any bear market that has been, never had a bear market rally. Bear market rally usually is what we're doing now. It's not uncommon for a stock market to retrace 50% or two thirds of the previous advance, only then to go back down the low. The um, previous advance um, is supposed to, this advance, excuse me, is supposed to, what it's supposed to do is get people to stop thinking that the low is, 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 is that there's gonna be a retest, which it largely has, because it seems like the consensus view is now, that's it, it's over, the Fed is genius, give Paul the Nobel Prize in economics. He single-handedly saved the economy. He single-handedly saved the stock market as well, too. That's what it's supposed to do. And yet the rally doesn't look like anything special as well. If there's any nuance I would give to the rally, um, the U.S. market is outpacing small cap U.S. stocks and foreign stocks, the EFA index. And yet the Fed has actually printed more money than everybody else. So I think that that's what's been um, driving this market um, as well too is with the Fed. So I suspect that we're gonna get some kind of a retest. I suspect the retest might be sooner rather than later because what you've got going on right now is there's an old saying in the markets, right? You buy the rumor, you sell the news. Well, the rumor we were buying was we're going to restart and it's going to be okay. We're going to restart and there's going to be a cure or a therapeutic or a vaccine or all of the above uh, as well. And now we're at sell the news. We are restarting. Georgia, the state of Georgia opened up its restaurants and businesses starting Monday. Next Monday, Tennessee, uh, excuse me, Texas is gonna, re, is gonna do something else like that. By mid-May, two weeks from now, half the country will be started up and some of the European countries will be started up too. Now we're going to see the reality. We can always, spin good yarns about how great it's going to be and how much we're going to boom when we start. Now we're starting and there's no more reason to spin yarns. There's only reasons to measure it now. And if the measurements come up short, people are afraid to go out. People are, are, are afraid to make orders. Businesses want to start working, but if they got no orders, they got no business. That's what happens. I think the disappointment sets in and that's what gets the market to roll over. Last thought for you, and then I'll open it up, uh, Sebastian, if any questions anybody has, is um, will the Fed buy stocks? That seems to be the favorite question of everybody. And the answer I'll give you is not unless they're dragged screaming and kicking, and that might even be enough. They really don't want to do it. And they don't want to do it for a couple of reasons. One, um, they don't want the political blowback. Let me give you a quick little nuance on this. So currently the Fed is buying corporate bonds. Um, the Fed can't really buy corporate bonds. So what really what's happening is Congress through the um, support package, the, the $2 trillion bailout stimulus bill or whatever we're calling it this week, allocated money for the Fed to buy corporate bonds. So they set up a special fund it's been funded by the taxpayer through the treasury and the Fed is providing the financing and they hired BlackRock to do the trades. So all the Fed is doing is they're being the financier in it. In reality, the buyer is the U.S. Treasury. The buyer is the U.S. taxpayer. The Fed is now in bed 
with the treasury and they've completely lost their independence, um, at least at this point as, as I see. They got a letter from Maxine Waters, a Democratic Congresswoman from California, saying that if they want to allocate any of these funds to any of these financial firms to help them, that that financial firm needs to have owner uh, uh, employee representation on their board. They need to have a $15 an hour uh, minimum wage. Uh, they need to have all of these other uh, rules and all of these other policies in place. Now, those are fine. Those are political goals and you can agree or disagree with them. But the point is the Fed is gonna get caught up in political goals and they are right now. If the Fed buys stocks, they're immediately going to get pressure from Congress. All right, Jay, now that you own a bunch of stocks, here's, here's the type of person we want you to vote for on the board of directors. Somebody who agrees with the New Deal, disagrees with the New Deal, is in favor of family leave, is in favor of this, or isn't in favor of that. And it will become so politicized. In fact, Fed, not only that, we want you to divest yourself of energy stocks because we don't like them. We want you to buy solar companies because we favor those just to pick a, one of many types of examples. So they don't want to buy stocks. What they probably will buy is ETFs. They might buy spiders. They might buy cubes on the, uh, on the next downturn uh, as well, too. But I don't think that they're actually going to buy stocks. So really, the question is, what should we be doing? Should we be doing nothing? and letting 30, 40, 50 million people go unemployed and play some big version of the Hunger Games? Um, should we be trying to hold everything together, still every day come in and still say, it's still January, 2020. Let's just try and put January, 2020 back together. Or should we maybe find a middle ground and say, look, world has changed. Deglobalization is coming, de-risking is coming. Um, work at home is coming. These are going to mean enormous changes to business models. Companies will fail. Other ones will sprout up. What we want to do is help the transition and as opposed to prevent the transition. And I think right now what the Fed is trying to do is prevent the transition. So are they making it better? In the very short term, there's 30 million people that are probably going to be happy that, they've, they, they're, that they're there. But in the long term, I don't think they are. Sebastian, you there? Um, I, I think that's what I've got. I'm here. Let yeah. me open it up for questions. Sure. Um, I, I, I'd like to maybe address some of these things here. And 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 um, so one, one thing that you mentioned where I thought maybe we could deserve some clarity is around um, the, um, the the bear market rally. So for la other laymen such as myself, can you explain what that means and what are the implications here? Yeah. So. <clears throat> The larger trend of the market is what? And I think the larger trend of the market is down, um, meaning that March 23rd's low was not the low for the entire move, that there's a lower low coming. But since March 23rd, the market has been rallying. It has retraced or recovered about 60% of the losses that it took before that. That's fairly typical. If the market goes back down to its previous low or a lower low, then the primary trend will have asserted itself. And what this rally was, was that it was a bear market rally. It was a rally within a larger downtrend. If, and that is very common to have these big, sharp, big, sharp, short term, short in days rally to make it very difficult to try and short the market all the way down because you wind up having these kind of rallies that kind of get in the way. If on the other hand, the February 19th, the March 23rd sell-off in the stock market, five weeks, 34% was it, and it's over with, then there is no bear market rally. We've, we're in the fifth week of a new bull market. That's never happened before. That you've actually went down once and it was all over with. You didn't kind of have like these stair steps on the way down. So I think what we're doing is we're just building a stair step to lower stock prices. And this stair step has gone up high enough that it's made everybody doubt that we're going to go down. And that's, that's basic contrarian opinion. And that's kind of the way you want it. How's that? Does that help make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, make, that makes a lot of sense. And, and thanks for, for clarifying that. Um, from, from the point of view of 
uh, I've written down a bunch of questions here. So from, from the point of view of, um, you know, like many, many states coming back online and coming back to work and opening restaurants and things like that. Um, you know, so I'm here in Europe and France where we have a sanitary situation that's, you know, quite dire on sort of scale of you know, countries and how COVID has affected us, uh, certainly not at the same level as the US at the moment. But, you know, if, if there were to be an I personally think that it, you know it's quite likely that there's another um, that there's another peak in in the um, in in the in the pandemic. Are we if it happens that there's another quarantine at some point where we we have to shut down again and perhaps we have to shut down you know two or three times uh, because of these false starts like we want to start the economy again and, and there's pressures to do that but in fact what's happening is we're just making the problem worse and worse and worse. Um, what do you think could be some could be some of the longer term trends on the economy and like how low could things go if say three months from now or you know around Christmas like we have to shut everything down again? Um, if there's a reinfection rate or a second wave, I think it would be devastating for the economy. And I'll I'll you know give you an a um, there was a story yesterday in Bloomberg. And they interviewed and they quoted Jess Staley, who is the CEO of Barclays Bank. Barclays Bank has a big building with thousands of people in it, 50, 60 stories in Midtown Manhattan, like hundreds of other companies have. Um, they're looking at the social distancing rules that are going to come down the pike. And one of the social distancing rules is going to be no more than two people in an elevator at any one time. It's not possible. It's not possible to either live will work in a high rise building with two people in the elevator at one time. The only reason it's working with residential in New York City is about a third to half of the population of New York City is left already. So what Jess Staley of Barclay said was that, look, here's this giant multi-billion dollar building and we got many, many floors on it. We might never go back to that building. Now you might think, oh, that's kind of alarmist. It might be. But if there's a second wave, then you can look whether it's Paris or New York or Chicago where I'm at, and you can look at all the big high rise buildings and go, they're done. They're not, no one's gonna wanna live there. No one's gonna wanna work there. You can't, you can't get on the subway to get there. You can't get in the elevator to get up to the floor. You can't work in close proximity of everybody else. That's why I think if there's a second wave, it will fundamentally change the way we live in urban areas and the way that we work in urban areas. And there will have to be a big rethink. I think what we're doing right now is gonna be permanent. I think, you know, not every day permanent, but every day you go to work, there's gonna be a certain number of people that you're gonna communicate with that used to be in the office next to you, which are now gonna be on your computer at home via uh, Zoom or something else. And you're just gonna keep rotating through and in and out of the office. Yeah, no, I, I, I really agree there. And I think that, you know, it, it's you know, the likeliness of a second wave in a lot of places like in Europe uh, or in the US is, is probably quite high. And if this does happen again, and, and like, and fundamentally our urban living situations and living in big cities just has to come apart and people start moving out into, you know, smaller secondary cities or into the country, uh, as is, as is predicted by like a lot of analysts and things like that, um, that like there's really going to be a fundamental reset. Of, it's not even it's not even like what happens to the economy is just everything gets reset. Like our entire mode of life gets reset uh, on a really fundamental level. And and also the remote aspect, you know, if if the tools and also the uh, the behaviors and like people's ability to work remotely um, become more widespread, I mean then really it, it kind of it kind of puts into question the entire premise of living in a big city like okay you live in a big city for many reasons perhaps you know like i live in paris because i love it here you know a lot of culture and everything but at the same time i live here because there are opportunities here and i want to be physically close to those opportunities same reason why people go to silicon valley or anywhere else if we have the tools and if you know remote work becomes commonplace well that in itself kind of falls apart and there's really not that much of a need to live in a big city anymore. And um, I think like just at a more like societal level that you just- Yeah, I mean, exactly. I, I mean, you know, you look at you look at the big cities and you ask the question, you know, right. Um, 
Why do you live in the city? Because there are things that you like to do, which almost always involve large gatherings of people, whether it's a restaurant, whether it's entertainment, um, you know, so you're in Paris. So I'll, I'll, I'll boil it down for you. When is the next Roland Garros finals going to be in front of a packed stadium? Is it going to be this fall when they do it? Is it going to be in two years? Is it going to be never? I mean, you know, that it's only going to be a televised event in front of a few people at, at some point. These are the type, and if you can't do that, and you can't go to a restaurant, and you can't go to theater, and you can't go to a big office building with lots of other people to work with, and you can't live in a high rise with other people, what's the point of living in a big city? So there is going to be some kind of a, a big change. Now, I'll tell you right now what some people are trying to think about is that everybody's hoping for the big Hail Mary pass, American football term there, and that is the vaccine. And I'll just make one quick comment about a vaccine. Too. We, we've had talks about the vaccine here. And yeah. And we, yeah. But, yeah. So my, my only comment is how many coronavirus vaccines have been developed in the history of medicine? Zero. They've never developed one in the history of medicine. Now, the argument is, well, they've never really been under the pressure to develop one like they have now. I kind of disagree with that. That doesn't mean they can't develop one right now. But I think what we're really hoping for is kind of a prayer. Oh, don't worry that we'll find something that we could all, oh, good, we get the vaccine, we inject ourselves, we could just go right back to the way that we were before. And, you know, if that happens, it happens. But the track record in developing coronavirus vaccines has not been very good. Yeah. All right, we're going to go to questions now. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of hogging you here, but we're going to go to questions. So if you have any questions that you'd like to ask uh, Jim directly, just raise your hand. Otherwise, we'll just start reading them here. Uh, but it's always better to get people on the microphone, I feel. So uh, raise your hand if you'd like to ask directly. Um, okay, so I guess people are a little shy today. So uh, I don't bite. You can ask. <laughs> uh, so um, I'm just sorry. I'm just There's actually many questions in the Q&A. There's over 10 questions. Oh, okay, so we've got some people here with their hands raised. So uh, I hope I'm pronouncing this right. Uh, Abe, Abhe. Go ahead. You have the microphone. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yes. Hey, so I had a quick question. So um, back in the 70s, uh, as you guys probably know, there was an oil shock um, and that caused uh, a huge supply shock, but it also caused the prices of everything to go up, um, which further caused like a demand shock. And in response, the Fed lowered interest rates and they pumped money into the economy for pretty much all of the 70s. And this worsened uh, the stagflation and in 81, we I think it was 81, we had a new Fed chairman, uh, Paul Volcker, and he had to step in and jack interest rates up to 20% to really reset the economy. Um, and though that was bad in the short term, that's what has led to the last 50 years of economic growth, in my opinion. Um, and it has all in that like interest rates have only gone lower and lower. Now we're back at zero. And, and it's either and I feel like we're at uh, a bifurcation where it's either like we can jack them up again or we can go into and do what the ECB and the uh, Bank of Japan have done and go into negative interest rate territory. And I was wondering which way do you think as far as interest rates go that the Fed could go and how long can we keep things at zero uh, without some further action? And do you see any parallels with what happened in the 70s? Um, well, the 70s were kind of the opposite of what we've got going now. But to answer your question directly, Jay Powell yesterday said no negative interest rates. Now, the problem with negative interest rates, it sounds great as a borrower. You know, Donald Trump is all in favor of negative interest rates. Why? Because he, he's a real estate developer. And somebody told him, here's the deal. You borrow a lot of money from the bank and the bank pays you a dividend or pays you a coupon payment every month. Wow, what a great idea. I borrow money from the bank and the bank pays me the interest payment every month. The problem is, the financial system is not set up for negative interest rates. It was not designed with negative interest rates in mind. It doesn't work properly. Europe has negative interest rates, but Europe has a big out because the US never had negative interest rates. And so and it's the reserve currency. So they could kind of lean on the positive cash flows, positive interest rates of the US in order to keep them going. So I don't see negative interest rates as being a a policy that they want to pursue, nor should they. 
because I think it would be very painful for the financial system. At the end of the day, crippling the financial, hey, look, you can call them banksters all you want, and you'll get sympathy from me, but crippling the banking system is not going to create, is not going to make things better. And that's what you risk with, with negative interest rates. What more can they do? I think what they're doing now, <clears throat> they did one to zero in interest rates, and now they're buying everything. They're buying treasuries. They're buying corporates. They're buying commercial paper. They're buying um, ETFs. They're buying municipal bonds. They can expand those programs by buying more, or they can expand those programs by buying other assets. That seems to be the road that they're going down. And if you looked at uh, the announcements today out of the ECB, they seem to be going sort of down the same road. Now, the ECB has got negative interest rates. And uh, the problem there is, you know, they, they can't admit mistakes. So they didn't touch their interest rates. They left them at minus 50 basis points. But then what they wound up doing after that is they wound up adding a bunch more borrowing programs. So they're going to buy stuff is what they're going to do. I ultimately think if they do enough of that, that on the other side of this, you'll probably get some inflation and higher interest rates in the long term. But over the medium term or so, I think you've got, uh, you know, the, the risk of deflation. And over the medium term, we're going to have, we're going to see investors do what many of them said to me, co-invest with the, with the Fed, is that they're going to, the game everybody's playing now is they're trying to front run the Fed and trying to buy what, the, what they're going to buy right before they buy it and sell it to the Fed at higher prices. Hope that got to your question. So we have another question here. Um, Jim, a big fan of your work. How do you frame the stimulus in terms of big buckets? How much is liquidity? Uh, sorry, how much is asset liquidity? How much is just adding debt? And how much is grants or government spending? And how do you frame uh, what this means for the market? Okay. Um, if I had to put it in, in, in those terms, in total, Something like about six to eight trillion dollars of total stimulus has been announced. Of that number, maybe two and a half to three of it has been government um, programs, so that we're going to borrow two and a half to three trillion dollars. And the other four and a half or five or so of that has been promises by the Fed to expand their balance sheet, which they've already done. Two trillion of that already. Um, by the way, if you want to put those numbers in a different ta in a different uh, venue, they have promised either through borrowing or through printing the equivalent of about four years of income tax receipts um, as well. A lot of that money that the government is borrowing is going to go towards uh, grants, conditional grants, where they're going to basically it starts off as a PPP loan you know, pay, a payment protection loan. And then if you meet certain criteria, which are not hard to meet, that, which is basically hire your workforce and don't fire anybody, um, then they'll forgive the loan and you get to keep the money. Um, as far as what the Fed is doing, they're in the process of, of, through these special purpose vehicles, financing the purchases of securities. Although, as I mentioned at the top, they haven't gotten to some of these programs yet, like the corporate bond program, but it's coming. Uh, if the Fed maintains the, pro the policies that they've had in the past, they will never sell them. They will never sell them. They will hold them to they mature until they mature. Um, that's probably one of the reasons why uh, people have asked, why is the Fed focused so short term? Because they don't want to sell them. They don't want to buy 30-year bonds because they don't want to hold on to them for 30 years. They want to prefer to buy four-year bonds or three-year bonds or two-year bonds because then they can get rid of them in a couple of years through a natural maturity um, process as well too. But they're hoping that by providing the liquidity that they're gonna give support to the market. Now they have, they have because the Fed's in there and everybody's co-investing with the Fed and everybody's running with the Fed right now. The question you have to ask yourself is if the Fed wasn't there, suppose is in the next minute, a headline came across our screens and it said, Jay Powell changed his mind, cancels every support program the Fed has. What would the markets do? They'd crash like 1987. I don't think that's a very controversial uh, idea as well too. Um, and so they're artificially supporting 
markets higher than they would be otherwise. Their hope is the economy restarts and whatever the fair value of the economy is, rises to their artificial support and justifies it. But if it doesn't, that's where I think that the market, this the bear market rally ends, is that we know the market I think is, is higher than it would be normally. We know it's overvalued, but hope is a powerful thing. There's this, you know, that there will be a restart and things will get better. Well, it hasn't started, but we know it's coming so we can imagine whatever we want out of it. But now that it's upon us right now, the question then becomes, what does it look like? And if it doesn't look like what, what you know, we think it's going to be slower, it's going to be less robust, then I think the market could go down. So the Fed is trying to support prices by buying them. The government is trying to hand out money in the form of a loan, but actually it's more of a grant. Eventually that loan will be forgiven. Hope that answered that question. So there's a couple of questions about digital currencies and we've talked about this before, you and I. And, and so, you know, here is one question. We're seeing China experimenting with uh, digital currencies. The Dutch are considering one too. I didn't know about that. Um, you know, how would a non-central bank digital currency have to evolve to become a reserve currency? So I guess here we're asking about you know, potentially Bitcoin or or stable coins in DeFi or something like that, and maybe, maybe you can you can also address your thoughts on on central bank uh, digital currencies as well. Um, the U.S. In, as far as fiat land goes, the U.S. dollar is the digital currency. I'm sorry, is the reserve currency. There is no fiat currency that will replace the dollar. The yuan is not convertible. The euro is not big enough. The yen is not big enough. And then they all get smaller after that. Um, taking all of the warts out of your uh, fiat currency and creating it to a digital currency, um, you know, uh, a digital yuan or a digital um, uh, euro doesn't fix that problem. The next reserve currency will be a crypto. It will be a non-government crypto. I believe. Now, now that I've said that, I don't know if it exists yet. I don't know if it's coming, if it's already one that we already have, and it still might be many, many years away at that point. How do I think it's going to evolve? I'm in the U.S., and I can tell you in the U.S., my perception is that when it comes to electronic payments, the U.S. is woefully behind everybody else that the rest of the world really accepts electronic payments. I believe in Europe, it's uh, Sweden is, is, is probably um, out there. And in the third world countries, if you look at Kenya with M-Pesa, there are more people that will accept digital payments through their phone one-on-one um, -on -one in Kenya than there is in the United States. So if you ask me how a digital currency, uh, non-central bank currency is gonna come about, some non-governmental, non-backed currency is going to come that is out of the reaches of a government. And it's going to take hold in the rest of the world. And it will come to the U.S. last is what it will come. But by that point, it will be so big and it will be so important that it will be impossible for them to ignore it um, at that point. So I think that that's how you're going to get a digital currency in order to become the uh, reserve currency. Now, it needs to do two things at the same time. It needs to be both the medium of exchange and a store of value. So it needs to have some kind of a platform on it that can satisfy, if need be, several million, if not tens of millions of transactions a second. And it also needs to have something like a stable coin has of some kind of a store of value. It cannot do like Bitcoin is doing, you know, where it was yesterday, it rallied a thousand dollars in an hour and a half, just because it has. No one is going to want the currency in their pocket in order to have that kind of extreme movement from hour to hour. So the idea is there. And I think the idea is there and, but we just haven't worked it out. I used to, for a hot second, think it might be Libra. And I'm not so you know sure, sure, but I do think I wasn't the only one that thought that, because when they announced Libra and they sent Dave Marcus up to the hill, boy, the congressman just jumped down his throat, uh, and that's because he came up with an idea that was going to compete with them. 
And you know, and it was so funny because I could, I, I used to joke, it was the members of the uh, House or the Senate Banking Committee or the House Finance Committee that were get, that were grilling about this. Yeah, because the legacy banks in the status quo are giving these congressmen tons and tons of money to maintain that status quo. And how dare you come in and upset our gravy train? That's why you can't come out of the U.S. It's going to have to become so big everywhere else that it's going to be forced upon the U.S. But if you look at the way that electronic payments are accepted in the rest of the world, it's there. If you can create the right structure, that structure will be adopted by everybody else, and then it will, it will, will have no choice in the U.S. Um, at that point. Follow-ups so, to that. Any other questions on that, on that subject? Um, yeah, yeah, sure. We got lots. Um, you have about five more minutes because our next speaker is uh, starting at quarter, uh, three quarters after the hour. Sure, um, I can go right up to them. Okay, cool. So it's uh, so here. Uh, so the economy will will eventually test the low. Additionally, the fact that we will likely see everything sell off as a result of leverage being deployed into this rally, along with your analysis that bonds are thin on thin ice as well. So the question is. Uh, is there a safe place to hide or would you advise a uh, continuation of the, you know, shorting the market by staying in bonds and cash? Uh, as far as a safe place to hide, um, you know, the answer is, is there, an, I, I always interpret that question. I mean, is there an asset class that you can hide in that should perform relatively well? Well, the obvious one is cash. Um, you know, it, 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 won't, it won't return you anything except all your money. You know, it's the return of money as opposed to the return on money um, as well. So that's, that's one. The second one in terms of asset classes, I would argue is gold. But the problem with gold is it's so financialized. You know, why do you buy gold? For the same reason you buy Bitcoin. It's supposed to be a way to get your money out of the financial system. And then what do people say? Well, I just bought GLD. GLD, you're still in the financial. Go buy Tesla. It's the same thing. You did not get your money out of the financial system if you bought GLD. Go to a dealer and buy coins. That's how you get your money out of the financial system. And guess what? The premium that physical gold is trading over the, the spot price on the exchanges is at a record. And a lot of the dealers are finding that uh, well, coin dealers and gold dealers they're running out of physical, uh, running out of the physical price. I ultimately think that that will be a play as we move forward. Will be that the get your money out of the financial system play of gold will work. But like I said, if you're going to think that you're going to play that with futures or GLD, you're you're just you're just a step away from Tesla. You haven't accomplished um, what you're going to accomplish. What about a crypto? Crypto is not going to work either because I can put my money in Bitcoin and but I can't do anything with Bitcoin in reality until I exchange it back to dollars or euros or something and then use it for something that I need. Once people start accepting it so that I could get my money into the financial system and not have to go back to it, it would uh, definitely work. Now, as far as, so that's is the asset classes. It'd probably be cash number one, gold number two. That's asset classes. Because I don't think bonds are gonna be a good return. I don't think stocks are there yet. As far as opportunities within the asset classes, sure, there might be some opportunities within the asset classes. If you like some of the consumer staple stocks, um, you know, if you want to make a case that there might be a low in, in energy, I think it's still too early to be looking for a, a low in energy um, as well. I think that the healthcare stocks are overdone and that they might be a short um, right now uh, as well. But those are more trading ideas than anything else um, as we go forward from here. Uh, there is some, some select um, electronic platform companies uh, in, in the financial sector like TradeWeb and Market Access that I've been high on for a long time as well too. But again, those are trading ideas. But if, I think your question was more about asset classes. And right now with things so in flux and so many unknowns coming and the big unknown coming is gonna be how does the restart look and does it work and do we have a reinfection? I think you're better off just worrying about the return of your money and, and something like cash, at least for the next several months, seems like the best idea. Or buy stocks of companies that are making safes. <laughs> right. Well, there's always um, going to be there's always going to be that idea. 
there's always going to be, you know, individual ideas up and down the line all over the place. Yeah. Okay. I think we can probably do one last question. Uh, what is your outlook on earnings over the next year? Are we likely to see the 50 and 80% declines uh, that happened in the tech and housing bubble? Yes. Um, earnings. Clubber Lang from Rocky Three. What's your prediction? Pain. That's what my prediction is for earnings. As far as 50 to 80% declines, we're already predicting that the second quarter earnings, the quarter we're in now, which will be reported in July, is going to be down 35% from a year ago. So we're getting into the ballpark of, of that. The analyst community has already announced they are going, to, well, they didn't announce, but they they have they're going to be slow. They're going to be slow to getting the earnings right because a quarter of the S&P 500 companies have cut off their um, um, earnings uh, uh, outlooks. Nobody wants to go out and hack their earnings call without justification from the company. They don't want to get the company mad. And if you're an analyst in a company, the dirty little secret is it's not just you want to get the company mad. You don't want to get your customers mad. Your customers are usually fund managers. And the fund managers get upset with you. You're shitting all over my stock by, by cutting the earnings. Stop doing it and stuff. So you're going to want to cut the earnings when you've got obvious reasons to do it. And if the companies are not providing guidance, you're not going to get it. So they're going to be slow at dropping their earnings. Earnings are going to continue to fall materially. They are falling faster than the stock market has been rising in this bear market rally. So what's been happening is the market's overvaluedness has really been skyrocketing by, by the measures that people like to use forward earnings and everything else. Stock market is getting pretty close to the 2000 peak in earnings. The excuse you'll hear is yes, but we know that it's going to be a disaster for the six months or year. We're investing on in what we think earnings are going to be in two years. And we see value based on two year out earnings to which I've always responded. Okay, show me a chart of two year out earnings going back 30 years. So I know when it's overvalued, when it's undervalued, it doesn't exist. So you've just made up a metric with no historical reference and then summarily said the market's cheap by this made up metric. I don't know if it is, you don't know if it is, but to your direct question, earnings are gonna keep going lower. And I think that they're gonna, um, because the analyst community is going to be intentionally slow at trying to cut their earnings. Yeah, we'll get to 50 to 80%. Yes, that by the traditional metrics, it will look like the market's overvalued. And the excuse you'll hear is, it doesn't matter what 2020 is going to be or early 21. We know it's a disaster. We're betting on where we think it's going to be in 2022. That's a made up metric. I don't know how that metric would have looked in 2008 or in 2000 or 1987. That metric didn't exist then. So I have no idea what is cheap or rich by that metric. So people are largely making up some of these valuation numbers. Uh, we have actually one last question from our next speaker. So uh, okay. go ahead, Creon. <laughs> Oh yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, what you just said about the made up metric, I mean, I would echo that and ask it as a question. That would sort of imply that the entire market has one time horizon, which they're claiming is two years and you're claiming not so. I mean, don't don't people have all sorts of different time horizons and we're seeing some kind of mix of guesses and time horizons in the pricing? Yes, the market does have all different types of time horizons most of the time. But what's happened in this crisis, I believe, is everybody's time horizon has collapsed to the same thing for now. Everybody's looking, trying to say there's some period of time where everything's going to be a disaster. The second quarter, the third quarter, maybe it's part of the fourth quarter, you know, uh, and so so that doesn't count. Um, you know, nobody don't pay attention to that. And then there's going to be some kind of a rebound. This is unusual that it's like this. In fact, it might be the only time it's been like this other than extreme financial crises. And then once we get past this, people will go back to their old time frames. But it is interesting because if you read analysis and if you talk to people, and even me in my presentation, we all have the same argument, or I'm sorry, not the same argument, the same time frame. We, 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 we you know, that is the next couple of quarters are gonna be really bad. And then hopefully the next few quarters or a year or two after that will be better. How much better will that be? And that's what we're basing our opinion on. But in normal periods, yeah, we're all over the lot from the next minute to the next 10 years. But right now, I think we've kind of all settled into the same time frame. 
that might explain the volatility that we see too, because we seem to have collapsed the time frames down. What's your take on it? You agree with that? Uh, me, who asked the question? Yeah. yeah. Do you agree with that? Um, well, I I'm not sure because you know I I'm not a big trader, uh, although I'm interested. But it, I'd like to follow up with my take on it in the in a, as a question, which is: Does this mean, in your mind, that strangely enough, there might be a longer term time horizon at play right now overall? Because, um, you know, as you say, everyone knows it's going to be a disaster over the next few quarters and they're looking out farther than that. Whereas normally most people are looking, if they're not high speed traders, they're only looking at the next quarter or the next earnings report or something like that. Yeah, I, I do think that there's going to be a longer term time frame at play. But, and I also think what's going to make that longer term time frame di uh, difficult, and this gets to kind of my Austrian leanings, I think that. If the market is allowed the creative destruction that it should, we're going to create new industries, we're going to create new companies, we're going to see a big turnover in what we perceive as the leaders of companies. I wouldn't be surprised if in five or eight years, if you want to go way out, we're going to have uh, five dominant companies, none of which will be the FANG companies today. There'll be some new companies that will come out of this. And so I think when people look to that longer term time horizon, I don't necessarily think that they're looking through the current list of available companies to figure out where that's coming from. Those companies don't exist yet. Those companies are still to come um, as we move forward from here. And that's where I think that they're going to start to, to focus on with that time frame. So the venture capital type, that's what keeps the venture capital money very popular. That's what keeps the startup money very popular. Um, as well, too, because the, you know, in in, in startup land, um, uh, you can Roger McNamee, famously of of Elevation Partners, once said that um, you know he became very rich with startups, but like ninety five to ninety eight percent of everything he puts his money into goes to zero, and one percent of what he does put his money into goes up a thousand fold, and it makes him a rich person. And that kind of investing mentality to find the next great idea, I think, is really where everybody's going to focus on it. Jim, I want to thank you for your time and for these uh, extremely valuable insights. And um, yeah, thank you so much for coming on. I think we learned a lot about what's going to be happening in the next couple of weeks, months, years. And you know, hopefully we can have you on again um, for next editions of Reset Everything because uh, uh, I'm sure we'll have some more. Sounds good. I had a good time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Cheers.